if you're looking at the government as a long-term customer in the future, SBIRs are going to be the easiest, speaking from NASA's perspective, SBIRs are going to be the easiest contract negotiation process that you go through. Everyone after that that's bigger dollar values, they'll get more complex because there's more controls in place, more cost accounting systems. And so lean into it with curiosity. Just as you think about how understanding your core technology is so important for your future business model, understanding how you actually go through working with your customer and having good customer relationships is also part of your core competency as your company. Hundreds of thousands of researchers around the world are working to improve life and address imminent threats to humanity. Often their research ends up in the scientific valley of death in the form of publications and patents that never see the light of day. That is about to change. Welcome to the Lab to Startup podcast, hosted by Naresh Sankara, founder and executive director of the Berkeley Postdoc Entrepreneurship Program at the University of California, Berkeley. This show has two main goals. Share the stories of those who have successfully founded startups based on their own research and highlight resources needed to help those aspiring to launch startups in the deep tech space. Whether it's electric cars, vaccines, addressing climate change concerns, or possibly establishing life on other planets, Naresh and his esteemed guests want to help scientists, engineers, faculty, and researchers bring their innovations to market. Learn more and subscribe today at labtostartup.com. And now, here's Naresh. My guest today is Jen Kustetik, the Director of Early Stage Innovations and Partnerships at NASA. In this episode of Lab to Startup, we will learn about various funding mechanisms that NASA provides to support innovation, primarily to support NASA space missions. We talk about the funding process through contracts, differences between grants and contracts, NASA's involvement after funding to support researchers and startups. We then talk about funding the oldest technologies, surprising speed of their funding process, partnership opportunities they offer, procurement of technologies by NASA, and many other topics. Jen shared so many stories like that of the landing of the Curiosity rover on Mars and other technologies they funded. I'm confident that you will find NASA to be a great partner and highly encourage everyone to find ways to work with them if you believe your technology can be used by NASA. Welcome to the show, Jen. I wanted to start this On a fun note, I was on your Twitter page and I saw you wearing a VR set called Vive. Maybe you can talk about that. Is that something that was developed at NASA? Yeah. So I believe that a couple different times that when I've traveled to some NASA centers, I like to do visits to the centers to check out the early stage research that NASA folks are working on or scientists, technologists and engineers are working on. And I believe that that might have been a headset either at Glenn or perhaps at JPL, but a lot of our centers actually have some work that they're doing in AR and VR. And I like to take pictures of the demos when I get them. So (laughs) that was one. Yeah. Cool. I thought a fun place to start this is with your job title. It seems very loaded. Maybe you can define the purview of your role as a director of early stage innovations and partnerships at NASA Space Technology Mission Directorate. So the audience gets the whole spectrum of things that you do. Yeah, sure. I'd love to. It is certainly a mouthful. So the Space Technology Mission Directorate is one of six major business units within the agency. The other ones are things like the Science Mission Directorate, the Aeronautics Research Mission Directorate, and the human exploration functions that you're aware of. But in space technology, we really work on developing the transformative technologies and game-changing technologies for future missions. And within space technology, we're divided like a pipeline amongst our programs. We've got our early stage investments that are the things that we're doing at the lowest technology readiness levels, and then our mid-TRL investments, and then our higher TRL investments. And I'm the program director for that first third. So roughly the budget is divided a third, a third, a third around those early stage activities, the valley of death activities in the middle, and then the technology demonstrations. And you see the quantity of projects decreasing dramatically, though, with the similar budgets as you get up higher, because obviously it's more expensive when you start putting things in space. So in the early stage portfolio that I lead, we fund about 700 or 800 new projects every year with roughly a $350 million budget. The next level that my colleague, Mickey Workheiser, leads, we fund about 100 projects a year. So you see we call from about seven to 800 to about 100. And at the final level with tech demonstrations, it's closer to about a couple dozen projects that are run annually through that portfolio of programs. And within the early stage portfolio, we engage 
literally anyone that you could imagine that might be an innovator that could have interest in space technology from university researchers and faculty and students to small businesses and startups to large companies as well as NASA centers and individuals, people that may not be affiliated with any organization. We can actually, through our Prizes and Challenges Authority, reach people writing individuals that win prize competitions at check, unaffiliated, completely unaffiliated with organizations. That's a way that we engage a lot of garage inventors or folks that are hobbyists on the side from their, their day job that are also interested in innovating and tinkering. So that's what makes us unique in this portfolio is that we can engage pretty much anyone anywhere that's working on developing space technology that is of an interest to NASA. And we do a lot of small bets at that early stage across the technology spectrum to see what's going to work to move on to next phases to try to help inform potential future space architectures and solutions of the future. Excellent. Thank you for that. Maybe you can talk a bit more about the funding mechanisms itself. The first time I approached you was because of the SBI or STTR grant mechanisms because of the interest of the audience. Now that I know that it's open to anybody, somebody working in the garage can actually apply for that. Maybe you can talk about the process at the funding levels that happen with the SBIRs and the STTRs. And I think you mentioned prizes and challenges will go there next. Yeah. So we make those awards, those roughly 700 to 800 awards a year through almost every tool that NASA has to offer. So we award contracts and we actually, through our SBIR and STTR awards, which is Small Business Innovation Research Awards, we actually award those as contracts at NASA. Just go on an aside real quick to explain why we do that, why that's significant before I go into the other vehicles we use like grants and prizes. But at NASA are roughly $200 million a year that we spend on SBIR and STTR. So it's the biggest chunk of the money within the ESIP portfolio, SBIR and STTR. We spend those as contracts largely because NASA sees itself as one of many customers of those solutions that are coming out of SBIRs and STTRs. You'll notice when you look across the federal government, because there's about 10 or more SBIR and STTR programs across the federal government, that some agencies make their awards as grants. Some agencies make their awards as contracts. A big key to how the decoding how the agency sees themselves in terms of if they see themselves as actually being a customer of those small businesses is whether or not they award contracts or grants. The grant making SBIR and STTR agencies like NIH and NSF, for example, they're not necessarily the ones that are gonna purchase the innovation that's coming out of the backside of those SBIR and STTR developments. It may be the commercial sector that is much more of the folks that are gonna be purchasing those innovations. However, when DOD or NASA makes an award, an SBIR or STTR award, we certainly recognize that we could be one of the customers. We're not necessarily the only customer on the back end for the development of those technologies, but we could be a customer and thus getting folks used to some of the rigor of working through government contracting at that entry state is good for them to know eventually how to actually work with the government if they want to work with the government eventually as a customer. Now I say that knowing that we try to make phase ones and phase twos less bureaucratic, less paperwork than a traditional contract, then you would see with something that would be much, much larger dollar value contract, for example. But it does help companies to start to understand what it looks like to work with the government as a customer, if that is part of their strategy downstream. So I just wanted to take a second to make that caveat that a lot of people do make the assumption that all SVIR and STTR awards are grants. But many agencies actually do award them as contracts. The difference there is nuanced about what you can tell from an agency if they're making an award through a contract or a grant. When you think about what kind of customer they see themselves being downstream for the technologies that are being developed through those vehicles. Well, I'll pause then to see if you have any questions on that before I jump into grants and prizes, which are really the other mechanisms through which we work. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. I did not know. I knew about the DOD part of it, but NASA, it makes sense as a customer because there are so few going up to the space. Maybe you can talk about the intricacies of how hard compared to a grant a contract is, just to give a taste of what people should be ready for before they apply for this. With grants, the purpose of a grant is different than the purpose of a contract. With a grant, it's supposed to be for funding assistance that helps advance some public good. And so typically with those, you can have, for example, you may at the end of a grant only have to submit a final report at the end of a grant that may be due months after the grant is actually completed, but that's like the major deliverable is a final report. With contracts, you may have more milestones or more interim steps you have to do. You may have to file 
quarterly progress reports. You may have to submit data as you go along. There may be milestones that you actually have to meet along the continuation of the contract. And so because contracts tend to be more about helping the government acquire a good or a service or a need that is something associated with the government is seeking to purchase. So the nature of the structure of those two vehicles, given that their philosophy of how they should be used is different, the structure should naturally be slightly different. So you experience something a little different if you're going through a contract as opposed to a grant. Now, with a grant, they can be more hands off. You may get less, your grant agreement officer may be less involved as a point of contact in the government. Now, that's not in all cases. For example, in our Space Tech Research Grants Program, which is the grants program that we make available to university faculty, researchers, students, and institutes. We prioritize at NASA identifying what we call research collaborators that are the points of contact for NASA on that grant that are heavily involved with the grantee in helping them to understand how the progress of their research may or may not align with NASA interests. Those research collaborators help to set up, in some instances, visiting experiences at a NASA center, which is an opportunity for the researcher to actually build a relationship with NASA researchers by coming and physically being present at a center for a while and also understanding what infusion paths or what paths might look like to make that research more relevant to NASA. And so in that instance, for those grants, we try really hard to make sure that the government touch point is strong so that it's not just research that's happening in a lab with very little understanding of what is interest to NASA other than what was in the original solicitation, but that it's an ongoing relationship and that it's an ongoing conversation. That's something that you find in all contracts because all contracts have a technical monitor or a core contracting officer representative that are the government point of contact that's monitoring the contract. And what I would tell small businesses and entrepreneurs all the time when I was in the program executive position prior to the position I'm in now for SBIR and STTR, that you really need to think about your core or your technical monitor once you've won an award as your champion. Develop an incredible relationship with that person. Be communicating with that person, trying to get insights from that person about other people that you could be talking to at the agency in order to understand what their needs are. Do your own mini I core right? <laughs> By understanding who are other people at the agency you should be talking to to understand their needs. And that's your in. That technical monitor and that core is really your entry point to the agency and really think about building the relationship with that technical monitor and that core in that way. And so you know, I know your question started with what should companies expect to see the difference between a contract and a grant. There are differences in the philosophical purpose of those two vehicles. And depending on how the agency intends to see those research dollars used, grants could be pretty hands-off or grants could be a little bit more hands-on depending on what we think adds the most value to the researcher, right? What's ultimately getting the researcher the most value and the agency the most value for those dollars. So we in the ESIP portfolio really try to make sure, regardless of the vehicle we're using, whether it's a contract, whether it's a grant, that we are providing those kinds of opportunities beyond the funding for people to interface with our subject matter experts, because that's a large part of decoding and understanding the space industry, since it's such a difficult place to work. I really like this process because I think as you make progress, you're actually getting feedback from the customer. I think that's a dark space for most other grants where you're just waiting to submit a progress report and you're not getting much from the feedback in terms of customer. I'm a proponent of such process. So let's keep that train of thought going on. So the phase one, phase two, what are the funding levels and how do you decide who gets and maybe you can talk about the process itself. So we have roughly... 25 to 26 different solicitations or activities that we release annually within the early stage innovation portfolio for these different communities, whether it be small businesses through SBIR and STTR, whether it be prizes and challenges, whether it be the space tech research grants that I mentioned earlier, we release five solicitations associated with that. But then also we have, which I haven't touched on yet, this program called NIAC, the NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts Program, which is really the program where we fund the most far out there concepts that could change the possible in aerospace. So TRL 1, 2, very, very early stage. The laws of physics say it could be possible, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done to like prove it out, prove out the concept that it actually is possible. And that's a place actually where we're open to ideas from anywhere. It's not just universities, not just small businesses, not just large businesses, not just individuals. We say we want those breakthrough ideas that could change the possible from wherever they are. And 
The NIAC program seeks those kinds of concepts. And then, of course, we also seek proposals from our internal workforce, too, through our Center Innovation Fund and our Early Career Initiative, which are limited to NASA researchers. The reason, though, that I express the, the range of solicitations that we have available is that each opportunity, each of these 20 plus opportunities that we release each year may be open to only specific audiences. So some may only be open to universities, some may only be open to small businesses. Each of these opportunities, some of them may only seek proposals in specific topic areas or problem areas. So we may release two or three problem areas that we wanna see early career faculty send us proposals to for that year. But other solicitations that we have are open. People just need to be able to show us alignment with NASA interests but that we don't specify necessarily a particular problem statement. So for example, when we ask for student fellowship proposals, those student fellows and graduate student fellows have to propose something that aligns with NASA's general technology interest areas, but we don't say it has to be in situ resource utilization for this particular part of extraction of this particular type of material. We leave it open. Same thing for NIAC. NIAC is open, though it has to be aligned with a NASA interest and a tie to a potential future architecture, and you have to express that to us. And other features are the funding amount, right? So at phase one, for most of these, we're looking at probably for across all of these different vehicles, on average, it's like $100,000 to a $200,000 first investment. There are exceptions to that. An SBIR phase one is $150,000. Early Career Faculty or Early Stage Innovation Award within our Space Tech Research Grants is roughly $200,000 a year for three years. So the ranges of the awards are in the hundreds of thousands at the entry point. As you start to get to phase twos or post phase twos in some of these opportunities, so the dollar values can get more expansive. So a phase two SBR or STTR award is $850,000 or $750,000 now. But after that, after phase two is where the big money opens up. We actually have up to $5 million second phase two award that we make available now annually that's tied to near-term needs where NASA sees themselves as a customer of a particular technology development that we know that small businesses are really kind of out in front on. And so we'll accelerate the development of those technologies through strategic investments through these second phase two awards. We're already starting to see evidence of great success in that acceleration vehicle, helping us to accelerate the path to infusion of some of these technologies that we're seeing out of SBIR and STTR. For example, a technology that is going to help with wheel traction on the Viper rover. That is one of the next rovers that is scheduled to be launched to the surface of the moon. That technology is being developed by a company out in Pittsburgh that we engaged, a small company that's grown that we've engaged through SBIR. We also have some autonomy software that's being integrated in a similar way in Gateway, which is the orbiting station around the moon, or the future orbiting station around the moon. So it's exciting to see how we can start with these small seed investments, tens of Ks to hundred of Ks, and then move those things that seem promising where we can continue to do risk reduction to subsequent stages and take some of the most promising stuff and accelerate it, both for small businesses, as well as, for example, NIAC has a phase three award now that's a $2 million award to try to help increase a phase three NIAC award to try to increase the likelihood that those early stage concepts can find pathways for transition as well. So this is a a winding answer in that it's complex because we have a number of different opportunities available. And so it can seem overwhelming to folks when they say, well, how the heck do I get started? And so I always encourage folks to get started in one place, right? Find the place that seems like the first good fit initially. If you're a small business, you know, take a stab at SBIR or our new Ignite program, which I could also talk about the Ignite program for a moment if you're interested at some point. Don't try to understand the whole system at the beginning. It's a complex ecosystem of award opportunities and potential partners that you could work with. Get your foot in in one place and then grow your understanding of other opportunities once you've gotten your foot in. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. I think this is one of the reasons I'm posting this podcast so that it's a good starting point, at least point them in the right direction and go explore, talk to somebody more relevant as well. Thank you for sharing that story about the Pittsburgh company that is tracking on the rover. Maybe you have a story about, you mentioned NIAC, about how beyond possible NASA helped maybe one of the technologies go to that and just so people can like actually think about working with NASA. Yeah, totally. So I can share a couple examples. So 
sure you're familiar with the Mars Perseverance rover. The Mars Perseverance rover, one of the cool things about that rover is that it actually carried a helicopter with it this time. Are you also familiar with Ingenuity? Ingenuity is a pretty cool concept. For a long time, there was doubt about whether or not anything could actually fly in the atmosphere of Mars, like sustained powered flight in the atmosphere of Mars because the atmosphere is so thin compared to the atmosphere of Earth. It's one of the reasons why when we land on the surface of Mars, we have to use entirely different entry, descent, and landing systems than we do when we land on Earth. Because when we land on Earth, the atmosphere is thicker. It slows us a lot more when we're coming down. Just the atmosphere itself slows us. So we have to handle all that heat. You have to handle the heat on the surface of Mars too. But if you tried to land on the surface of Mars the same way that you land on the surface of Earth, you'd splat like a mosquito on a windshield because there's not enough to slow you down, which is why I recommend anybody watch the seven minutes of terror video. It's just a phenomenal video that was done for curiosity, but redone again for perseverance. And it talks through the different stages of the landing sequence. So if you just really want to nerd out to something and how really ambitious and courageous a lot of the things that our engineers and mission leaders at NASA do, you really sit in the seat of the anxiety when they were doing that entry descent landing sequence for the first time when curiosity was landing, which is like the size of an SUV not really knowing if each of the stages of the deployment of the EDL sequence had worked until seven minutes after it had actually occurred in the real world because of communication delays. It's also so far away that there's a communication delay. So by the time that we found out about one of the sequences happening or not happening, Curiosity could have been flattened on the surface of Mars or landed successfully on the surface of Mars for seven minutes. And we didn't really know until we got the comms back. So it's just a fascinating video. I highly recommend anybody watch it. But the helicopter that was part of the Perseverance rover, which was this second rover landed recently, was actually a concept that was originally explored through the NIAC program. There was a study that was proposed in the 90s, in the late 90s, that said, hey, you know, we think we might be able to do powered flight on the surface of Mars. This is the physics. So we think that it would work. And the PI for that NIAC award had a happenstance hallway interaction with who would become the future PI for a large part of the Mars rovers missions who adopted the concept and helped to shepherd it through the science mission director through the development process to actually help it become a reality. But the initial idea that it was even possible and the physics behind it, the original kind of exploration of it was something that came in through a NIAC study. And interestingly, now you see that the Mars sample return architecture, which is the next big Mars mission that the agency has been working on, includes helicopters as part of its baseline architecture. It used to have an architecture where everything depended on rovers, right? Little baby rovers that would go out and extend and collect things. But now helicopters are part of that core architecture for the Mars sample return mission. And so I tell you that story because something that started as just an idea that then became a pilot, like a prototype. The Ingenuity helicopter was a tech demo on the Mars Perseverance rover. And that tech demo has now influenced the architecture for a future mission. That takes some time to do because space is hard and we need to prove it. You need to pre-prove that it can work because it's expensive, it's hard, and you don't want to take that many chances when it is so expensive and it's hard and it takes a long time. But that's a really great example of an idea feeding a future mission architecture. We have another one that's coming up soon. Hopefully this year we'll see it launch is a CATSAT mission, which is an inflatable antenna that was also developed out of NIAC concepts and Hopefully we'll get its demo flight this year and unlock similar changes in the ways that we think about architectures of space in the future. Yeah, these are absolutely amazing stories. I mean, most people don't know the kind of science that goes behind this. I think we need a bigger mouthpiece to tell the stories to get more support for such launches. I will have a link for these videos in my show notes for those interested. What I was going to talk about was about, you mentioned about something called the dual use technologies, the Ignite program. Maybe you can shed some light on that as well. The SBIR program at NASA historically had one annual solicitation where we would release something like 80 topics, maybe, that we call subtopics in that solicitation a year. So like 80 problem statements every year. And that would be the one opportunity for small businesses each year to navigate through those 80 subtopics, find where they thought that they had a fit, propose to that particular subtopic or problem statement. And then they find out three months later after proposal, whether or not they were selected for phase one and then get started with that journey I described before phase one, phase two, post phase two, multi-year journey through phase ones, phase twos and post phase twos. Well, we were finding that for good reason, 
many of the subtopics that were showing up in our mainline solicitation could be seen as quite niche, right? Solving a very specific NASA challenge that there was a particular stakeholder community within NASA that wanted to see that challenge solved, which indicated that perhaps they could be the customer of that downstream. One colleague, Mark Davidson out of JPL that said something years ago that stuck with me and I always attribute this to him when I say it, is oftentimes when we think about those niche applications though, we're perhaps seeding a market of five. One to bake, one to break, one to shake, one to put on the shelf and one to fly, right? If NASA is the sole customer and we're thinking about maybe using it once, that a market does not make necessarily or initially, unless there are spin-off applications or other products that a company can develop that are less exquisite than the version that NASA needs, or that they've got a good approach to developing product lines for other customers based on the early stage R&D that they do through NASA. A good example of a company that has figured out how to do that well is Virginia Diodes out of Virginia. We have a good success story on the SBIR website about how they work through the SBIR program in order to help prototype future products and then build new product lines and then deploy those through the established network of customers that they have. But that's like one business model, right? That's a business model that a small business could have when they think about working through SBIR, where NASA may be a customer, but not the only customer that they work with. That's not necessarily always the startup model. In fact, that's not the startup model necessarily <laughs> with how they think about the speed at which they're looking to work, kind of the established customers they have, how they think about product lines. And so we were finding that the entry points to the types of firms who may see NASA as maybe a customer, but not the only customer, also given the fact that the commercial space industry is growing and expanding at such an exciting rate, that perhaps we could think about our role in that ecosystem a little differently, as opposed to saying NASA will specify a very particular niche technology area of advancement that we would like to see. We specify a slightly broader topic, one that we understand that there is also a commercial pull for solutions in that area. And then we operate and we evaluate slightly differently in that other on-ramp. And so that other on-ramp, which we've created, we're now going into the second year of that other on-ramp, is called the SBR Ignite program. Last year was our first year of the pilot for that. We released six very broad topics and received an overwhelming response from the community. For that first year, we were only able to make 12 awards since it was a pilot. But the goal with the SBIR Ignite program is to operate more like an investor. We know we're not an investor. The government is not trying to be an investor. We also know that that's not our role and that's not our skill set, right? NASA has a lot of scientists, technologists, and engineers. We're very good at assessing technical merit and technical potential of proposals that come in, but we're not as specialized in assessing the business model as, for example, VCs, angels, and other investors are. That's what they specialize in, right? They don't necessarily specialize in the technology assessment like we do. And so we're playing to our strengths. We're not like trying to be investors. I want to emphasize that. But we did think that it would be better to experiment with a approach that maybe took on more of that spirit in the way that the cadence of that program ran. So a few things that are notable about the Ignite vehicle. One, they're slightly more open, commercially oriented topics. Two, the evaluation criteria, though it's the same as it is for a regular SBIR phase one, the scoring is much more heavily weighted towards commercial potential of the technology. And so we do assess commercial potential in the mainline solicitation and the one that we release every year, but the weight, the overall score of that for Ignite is higher. We're intentionally trying to fund companies that have more of a view of the path to commercialization for the technology that they're developing, as opposed to a fundamental R&D question or exploratory R&D question. That's the second feature. And a third feature is, is that we are trying to take an approach where we reduce the funding gap between phase one and phase two by having the phase two proposal be due earlier during the phase one performance period and taking a stance that if the company is meeting its milestones in phase one, if it is progressing the way that it is supposed to be progressing and it has proposed a solid phase two proposal, that we will act more as an investor in terms of that second funding decision, saying if you've met your milestones and you have a good phase two proposal, our intent is to fund you to phase two. 
Now, with the other solicitation, we only have about a 35% selection rate from phase one to phase two. It's very competitive between phase one and phase two. With Ignite, we're trying to act more like that the Ignite investment is a million dollar investment. It's that 150K phase one and the 850 phase two, as opposed to it's 150K investment and then you compete for that 850K investment. To be clear, you are still competing for a phase two. It's not a given. You have to demonstrate progress against phase one, have a good phase two proposal, but we're trying to act faster and simpler and more commercially friendly. And that's where the dual use principle comes in, right? Is that we're looking at funding and seeding technologies that we see not only as interest for NASA to be able to use, it has to be relevant to us, but that we can also understand and see the potential pathway in use for the commercial space market as well. Great. Speaking of technology assessment, one question I often get is the teams that help you evaluate these technologies, the grant proposals that are coming through. What is the makeup and the thought process? Because I hear a lot of complaints that most of the people evaluating these grants are from academia. They don't really have a sense of the business. I'm trying to see like if anything different happens at NASA when you're assessing these proposals. Yeah, so we certainly lean on our internal NASA workforce on the technical reviews. We've got world-class technical capability at NASA, and we lean on those technical experts and SMEs for the technical reviews. We also have employed a commercial peer review team in the past that is actually a compilation of external, more business-oriented reviewers that help us with the commercialization assessment. And that is also true with Ignite. We very much know that NASA technical subject matter experts are not the best folks to be looking at assessing a business plan. And we've experimented with, over the years, various different ways to tap into other communities that have more depth of knowledge in those areas to get higher quality assessments. That is such a welcome change because I had those experiences previously, but I'm glad things are moving in the right direction. Let's shift the gears slightly towards partnerships. That's one area you oversee as well, even going back to these rovers and all. How does one find partnerships? How do you test these things? The space environment is like hard to recreate on Earth. Maybe you can use that story to explain how things were tested, the technologies were tested, and how you help them partner, if not with NASA, with some other bodies that add value to these proposals. Oh, man, there's so much that I could talk about in terms of resources beyond money that is available to help teams test and prototype and demonstrate their technologies. I'll just do a few examples. First, within the SBIR program, there is a we make at least one thing available to help companies in this way. It's called a facility use agreement. And so actually, when you propose to SBIR and we encourage us mostly in phase two, because phase one, the dollar values just aren't high enough to maybe allow. And also it's still early TRL. So it might be more appropriate if phase two or beyond. But we will actually allow the company to use funds from the SBIR award to pay for facility use at a NASA center or elsewhere to further the development of their technology. So say they want to get lunar vacuum chamber conditions in order to demonstrate their technology. Well, some of those exist at Glenn Research Center. A company may decide that they want to enter into a facility use agreement, get a cost estimate for what it would cost to use that facility and have that be part of their proposal for the SBIR phase two. So they can actually use their funds to secure the resources that are necessary in order to get that specialty testing that they would need. Another really great example is another STMD program, actually, that's called the Flight Opportunities Program. And this is a program that exists to provide suborbital flight test opportunities to small businesses, large businesses, universities, students. They've got a number of really exciting activities that go on in the Flight Opportunities Program. And they will actually, and this is another SBIR example, but when you get to the post phase two, when you're coming out of phase two and looking at the opportunities after phase two in SBIR, they'll actually match dollar for dollar with the SBIR program dollars to get a suborbital flight test. And we have suborbital flight test platforms, over a dozen of them available. And those folks are running suborbital flight campaigns almost weekly. Just heard from my colleague, Chris, that just this past Tuesday or Friday and Monday, we flew a number of student payloads through the Tech Prize Challenge, which is a challenge that we do for middle school, high school, I believe, students, K through 12 students around the country, for them to get their first experience to 
develop a payload that then gets a suborbital test opportunity. And we do that through prize competitions to students around the country. But those flight opportunities are available to small businesses, to universities, to NASA researchers, and it's an incredible resource. We've kind of contracted with the folks that do suborbital launch, that are the suborbital launch providers, and we are the matchmaker where we know who they're the supply of the actual capacity that can get into suborbital space to do testing or a suborbital environment to do testing. And then they match it with the demand of the people that actually need to do that testing and help to arrange those flight opportunities. And we see flight opportunities too, not as a single one-time test, right? You, You oftentimes will do the test It won't work exactly as you thought it was going to. And so you learn, you iterate, and you do another one. And so their whole theory is to try to increase the pace of space by allowing for more frequent testing opportunities for a variety of different stages of technology developments with a variety of communities. So it doesn't just have to be labs, like I mentioned earlier, like a lunar vacuum chamber can also be getting access to relevant test environments, test environments that start to actually see what your technology does in an environment that's simulating what it might look like once it's in space, which is what the Flight Opportunities Program can help with. And there are also a number of different examples where our payloads make it to the International Space Station for testing. Great example there is the additive manufacturing facility doing 3D printing in space. I believe the biofabrication facility is also going to be printing out a meniscus it was TechShot that was acquired by Redwire. They are doing a really exciting biofabrication experiment now on the International Space Station. That group got their start through SBIR funding. We've seen university researchers do the same thing. There's Gecko Gripper technology that has been demoed on the International Space Station that came out of our Space Tech Research Grants opportunities. And so there's a variety of different ways that teams, once they get their foot in the door, can figure out how to navigate not only the funding opportunities, right, to get that critical research funding to help advance their technology, but also access to the relevant test environments that help them to increase the technology readiness and decrease the risk of those technologies. What a time to be living in, right? Like middle school and high school kids can send stuff into orbit and test their technologies, iterate and keep going at it. Wow. Thank you for sharing that information. I know we don't have too much time, but I want to slightly go into another angle of this about procurement, because you can go through the phase one, phase two, and phase three, or post phase two. How does that procurement work? Because we hear horror stories about how tough working with the government is. Maybe you can help entrepreneurs or scientists Think about those things. Prepare for that. What have the successful companies done? Maybe you can talk about failures as well. What have people not done right so that procurement became impossible? This may sound a little glib, but a lot of it is doing the homework in advance to think about not waiting till the last minute. Do your homework, right? We all procrastinate. How many all-nighters did we all pull in college? Too many. Couldn't do it anymore for thermo, thermodynamics. Our solicitations lay out the critical things that you got to do early. You got to register and get your SAMs and your DUNS number as a small business. And that's not something that we control at NASA. That's a different process, right, of just getting a number that allows you to do business with the government. Don't wait on that. You know, don't wait until a week before your submission is due. That's a thing that as soon as you start thinking about government funding, just go ahead and get those things in place. Those aren't the things that you have to worry about when you're putting together a proposal. Then what you can focus on when you're putting together your proposal is your technical approach and getting a good solid budget, justified budget together for what you're proposing. So it's not as much on the administrative. Get the administrative stuff done. That is all very clearly laid out in the SBR solicitations, what the important registrations and administrative are. The other piece is, is that at least for us, since you specifically asked about procurement and not grants, I'm just talking about contracts side of things right now. We work all of our contract negotiations for SBIRs through a central organization at NASA. It's called the NASA Shared Services Center, the NSSC. And those folks have a real streamlined process to negotiate, especially phase one contracts. We're actually, I believe we're still fastest in government in terms of total time to navigate or to negotiate a phase one contract. It's a maximum of 45 days from the point of notification of award to the actual award date. 45 days. 
it's fast for the SBIRs. I will not say that that's necessarily what people should expect in larger procurements <laughs> when they're more complex and there might be more negotiation involved, but we really try to make those SBIR phase ones and phase twos almost like pretty standard contract templates so that they move as quickly as possible. There's some basic information that you have to be able to provide your contracting officer, but the first time is always the hardest. And approaching it with curiosity and learning as opposed to frustration, I think is the healthy way to do it. Because if you're looking at the government as a long-term customer in the future, SBIRs are going to be the easiest, speaking from NASA's perspective, SBIRs are going to be the easiest contract negotiation process that you go through. Everyone after that, that's bigger dollar values, they'll get more complex because there's more controls in place, more cost accounting systems. And so lean into it with curiosity. Just as you think about how understanding your core technology is so important for your future business model, understanding how you actually go through working with your customer and having good customer relationships is also part of your core competency as your company in order to make that the most efficient, least painful process possible. And so I think a lot of it can be the mindset. We are also open to feedback. All of our programs within ESIP and with STMD are open to Small Business University, other folks' feedback about what's difficult in our process, address barriers to entry, or where there might be difficult steps in the process. We are open. We do have a customer first mentality, and we see our researchers and the innovators we work with as being one of our core customer sets. It's not just you come work for us. No, no, we work together in order to advance technology and space capability for the nation. And so we honestly look at those folks that are proposing and working with us on the researcher side as being customers for the federal funding that we steward for the nation and for NASA. So if you have an experience, you'd like to share some of that feedback, feel free to reach out and share that feedback with us. Eye-opening, and I'm learning so many things here, and I'm glad running the organization the way you are. One of the points that came up during a intro call was about licensing technologies from NASA. How does that work? The tech transfer office there, almost like a marketplace where somebody can just check out the technologies or even the programs that you're funding. Maybe they don't apply to you directly, but others can actually license the technologies. How does that work? Yeah, I'm so glad that you brought that up because that was one of the things that I was going to actually ask to bring up at the end if we didn't talk about technology transfer, because I think one of the things also often that's not thought about as an asset, right? We talked earlier about how you go to the government for funding or you go to the government for facilities or you go to the government for subject matter expertise. We can also go to the government for technology, patents. And we, through the SBIR program specifically, have a thing called TAV, which is technology available for use, where essentially if you as a small business or entrepreneur would like to license a NASA technology and use SBIR funding to help develop products or applications leveraging that NASA technology, by being an SBIR company, a small business company that wants to work through that mechanism, we'll make a license available to you for free for a certain amount of time as you carve out your market space, determine whether or not it's something that you want to move forward with, and before we negotiate more of a full-on license with you. So that is another asset. We have a whole program within our technology transfer program that is really focused on trying to accelerate venture creation, leveraging NASA technology and inventions. I mean, we are, in addition to being the agency that does ambitious human exploration and a science in space, we invent a lot. We're a lab. There's a lot of inventions that come out of our labs and we patent much of that. And then part of our goal is to make those patents broadly available through licenses, not just used for spinoffs for things that we never maybe thought of outside of space that these technologies could be applicable to, but also for space applications as well. A great example of that is one of the companies that won an inaugural Ignite Award, a Canopy Aerospace. That company formed out of a technology transfer accelerator that we ran a couple years ago, leveraging a license for a technology that's focused on entry, descent, and landing approaches. That's a core part of their business model is this NASA technology licensing approach. And they subsequently won a Ignite Award and are continuing on their path for commercialization of their technology, the business model for their technology. And so it doesn't necessarily just need to be that the company or the entrepreneur comes up with the technology and develops that technology all the way through from development to product to market. There's other ways of thinking about, well, look at what technology has already been invented and 
work through applications of those technologies where then the risk that you're taking on is the business risk, not the technology risk. Now there is some technology risk in the the modification or the continued development of that technology for the application that you're working on. But there's a number of different ways to think about working through NASA and with NASA assets in order to develop new products and services. So I'd encourage you to check out the technology transfer program that we have a portal called technology.nasa.gov that actually lists not only our patent portfolio, but our software catalog. We have a ton of software available for use. We do thousands of software use agreements every year. We do hundreds of licenses every year. And we also do a ton of virtual events that also we have a startup series that helps folks get inspired about how other startups have leveraged NASA technology in order to get their business models and their products started. And as I mentioned before, we run a number of different incubators and accelerators that are focused specifically on that. How do we leverage NASA technology into the ventures of the future? So you don't necessarily have to come with your own technology idea. You can also think about leveraging what we've already got in the NASA technology portfolio when you think about building a company. This is phenomenal. I'm going to have a link to all the resources that you mentioned in my show notes. But Thank you so much. I know you're running out of time. I would love to bring you back. So many stories and issues that I want to talk about, but this is enlightening. I'm sure my audience will love listening to you talk. Thank you for everything that you're doing there. Yeah, just one other pitch that I'd like to make for folks, because I know a large part of your audience is also university folks, students and postdocs and faculty that are doing research in universities that are trying to think about how they spin out that value as well want to just make sure that folks are aware of something relatively recent that we're piloting for NASA, which is NASA's version of the i program. So we've partnered with NSF. We are using their infrastructure, their nodes. We didn't like recreate an i program. We think what NSF is doing is great, but we did want to offer some encouragement to academic researchers who have an interest in potentially spinning off their research into ventures that are relevant to NASA's interests. We wanted to try to help stimulate some of that and create the space and the time to do that by making i awards available to university recipients. And that's particularly good for folks that maybe haven't found a way in to NASA yet, aren't necessarily as familiar with how to work with NASA. Uh, that i solicitation is one that is available to rolling solicitation. So it's open all year, which is a little different from all the other solicitations we run where it's one time a year. You can basically apply for i at any time. And I believe it's, we make $15,000 available to participate in a regional short course for i for the teams. And after participating in the regional course, if there's a there there, we'll make a higher amount of funding. I believe it's $40,000 available for participating in the national course. And that funding really goes to paying for travel associated with customer discovery, the fee for participating in the i program, an entrepreneurial lead stipend, and a variety of other things. But for folks that are from the academic community that are really contemplating this venture creation angle and the space technology area, I just encourage folks to look at that as a low barrier to entry. It's a three-page proposal pretty easy to get your foot in the door that way as well. So thank you so much for taking the time to explore what we're doing in the early stage innovation and partnerships portfolio at NASA. I personally think that this is some of the coolest content and one of the coolest jobs in the galaxy. So I'm very grateful and privileged to be able to be the person that's holding the baton at this point in time. Many of these programs are 40 plus years old. So there were many people before me, there will be many people after me, and these are great assets and jewels for the nation. And we just want to make sure that we're using them to the maximum extent possible to create the most value for NASA, the nation and the world. So thank you for letting us be able to get the word out a little bit to your community. We appreciate it. I definitely envy your position because you get to see the coolest of the technologies coming through your desk. Good luck and thank you so much, Jen. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Lab to Startup podcast. You can find links to the resources and programs mentioned in these episodes, connect with Naresh, or subscribe to this show at labtostartup.com.